Good morning and welcome to the 32nd meeting of the committee in 2018. I'd like to remind members and the public to turn off mobile phones and any members using electronic devices to access committee papers should please ensure that they're turned to silent. The first item on the agenda today is consideration of the Census Amendment Scotland Bill at Stage 1. And this morning we'll be taking evidence uh, from two panels. And I would like to start by welcoming our first panel. Uh, we have Rosa Friedman, Professor of Law, Conflict and Global Development at Reading University. And Susan Smith uh, of, from the Organisation for Women Scotland. Thank you for coming uh, to give evidence to us today and for your written submission. Uh, before I move to questions, um, just for clarity, because this bill has just been introduced, it might be helpful for the record um, to say, uh, make a few remarks about the purpose of the bill. Uh, in the explanatory notes accompanying the bill, it states that the purpose of the bill is to make questions on sexual orientation and gender identity in the 2021 census voluntary. And we've been told as a committee that the wording of these questions, if they're asked, will be put forward at a later date and Parliament will be able to deliberate on them then. However, the bill as introduced also makes a change uh, to the schedule of the 1920 census bill by inserting the words, including gender identity, after sex. And while it's not in the bill, we understand there's consideration being given to include a third option in the sex question to include uh, a, a third option as well as male and female. And that's in addition to uh, the gender identity question which is proposed to be asked. Um, so several of our um, uh, pieces of written evidence have pointed out that this conflates the term uh, sex with gender identity and that that is problematic. We have received a, a letter uh, this morning from uh, the National Records of Scotland who are the bill team and they have, uh, they have pointed out that, that this may be an issue in terms of the drafting of the bill and uh, they uh, would be happy to, to consider anything that the committee recommends uh, in that area. So I hope that's all clear. Um, I shall now, I'd like to ask Professor Friedman from a legal point of view, um, your view on this particular aspect of the bill, because in your submission, you say conflating sex and gender identity will undermine sex as a separate category protected by law. And I assume that you're saying that you're concerned about this because it sets a precedent. Yes, indeed. Uh, thank you for inviting me to come today. Um, indeed, if we separate sex and gender reassignment, gender identity, gender presentation, however the wording might become, then we are keeping two separate protected characteristics as we have under law. Um, in the same way that we wouldn't conflate race and religion or other protected characteristics, bringing this idea of a third category into sex, a third category being a non-binary gender into sex, or bringing together gender identity and sex in one question is bringing together two protected characteristics and thus undermining both of them, essentially, in terms of the Equality Act. I see. And just uh, for people who might be unfamiliar with this subject and uh, who might not be clear, my understanding is that gender identity um, isn't just about people who have had surgery to change their uh, to change their sexual appearance. It, it's much broader than that, as I understand it. Yes, well, currently, um, internationally, at the regional, the European level, and currently within the UK, we don't have definitions of gender identity. Um, in Massachusetts, they say gender identity is the gender that someone identifies as, and that's their law. Um, in terms of international law, Gender identity is the similar to what Stonewall says. It's an umbrella term for various different individuals, um, whether it's people who've had gender reassignment, people who are transsexual, whether it's people who are transvestites, who are cross-dressers, and all sorts of other people as well. So it's a, a long list, but it's not a definition. So protecting gender identity or putting gender identity into the census without a definition would lack clarity, would require a definition in terms of moving forward for law. Um, but gender reassignment is currently protected. Gender reassignment is what we have under the Gender Recognition Act. It's about a meaningful transition. There's, there's certain criteria. You have to live for two years um, in, the, in the preferred sex that you, that you would like to be identified with. You have to have medical certificates uh, and so on. There's no problem from a legal point of view of protecting gender identity so long as it's defined. But I think putting this into a bill now without a definition is 
going to cause more trouble down the road, not only for this bill, but generally for the precedent that it sets. OK. And, and can I ask both of you what, what practical, what, what would the practical effect of, of such a change be? Well, we're really concerned about, for, for the users, that um, obviously biological sex is immutable. Uh, humans are sexually dimorphic. Um, and there are various implications for health providers especially how many cervical screening programs do you need to roll out there are also issues um, about um, public sector equality duty as defined under the equality act um, so looking at pay gaps um, when we're considering who is doing the caring in society these things are captured by the census but if they if the definition of sex is no longer robust and we don't really know <laughs> Um, what, what the uh, people who are answering the question uh, understand by that definition, then all of that data becomes problematic. So we think from the point of view of the users, it's really important to have a clear definition on the one hand of biological sex for the provision of the services and the protections that people will need under equality duty. And on the other hand, um, the, if the additional question is to be asked about gender identity, um, it needs to be worked out with the users what they need that information for and how they can best utilise that. So it's very important if they are saying there's a need for that, that that is also a robust definition and they also have um, the, 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 the end goal in sight as to what that information will provide. But if, um, if they both become conflated, there are confusions around them, both of them become meaningless. I see. And in terms of that particular point about the data, the, the written submission from uh, the Scottish Transgender Alliance says that the number of, of trans people is, is so small and scattered that the effect on the data won't be significant. There will be no effect on the data. Well, this is why we need to go back to definitions. Um, so the number of people with a gender recognition certificate is very small, and maybe the number of people who are what traditionally would be known as transsexuals is very small. But in terms of people who identify as being non-binary, um, particularly young people, people who identify within the broader umbrella of gender identity as Stonewall defines it, we don't know what those numbers are. And it might be um, important to have a gender identity question that's separate to sex with a very clear definition of what gender identity means in order to gather that data of how many people there are because none of us know um, and this is one of the this has been one of the big things across all the consultations across all of Europe around self-identification is we don't know the numbers in terms of um, in terms of data, I think it's important to keep sex obviously separate, but to have something on gender identity, we need to know the data around domestic violence in terms of trans identifying individuals. We need to know the data around suicides. We need to know the data around pay gaps. We need to know the data around people who are forced into, uh, into sex work because lots of things are bandied around and this is a very vulnerable community. And actually having a very separate question would allow us to gather that data and to be able to provide the services needed for that community. Keeping this sort of broad term gender identity without a definition doesn't allow any of us to help protect this, this group. Okay, thank you very much. I'll now move on to uh, Claire Baker, the Deputy Convener. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, as the Convener outlined, the legislation in front of us is about making a set of questions voluntary. Um, do you support <coughs> the proposal to include questions on, at the moment it's defined as religions already in that category, <coughs> and it suggests adding in sexual orientation and gender identity. Are you um, happy with those being voluntary? And are you happy with the definitions that are used? We've had some submissions that question the use of gender identity being the description for those set of voluntary questions, but are you satisfied with that and with the voluntary status as proposed? Really covered, Rose has obviously really covered a lot of the issues with gender identity and how it has, the if, definition if to, must be uh -huh. nailed down. But yes, it's, I, I think it, it probably is important. I, 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 it's not really something that's within the remit from the point of view of we're looking at the impact on women and girls, obviously. Um, but clearly, there are reasons why people are not comfortable with um, revealing sexual orientation and, or, or gender identity. So I think it's, it's fair that that should be voluntary, yes. I, think, I also think in terms of definitions... Like I said, 
no one has defined this properly. Um, the United Nations haven't defined this properly. The European Court of Human Rights haven't defined this properly. I think if you if if anyone is going to include something like this in a census, there needs to be a definition so that the people who are answering this can answer it correctly and can answer it to the best of their ability. Um, I'm not particularly happy with the definitions set out. Um, I think if Scotland wants to take the lead on defining gender identity, that would be great. But I think there needs to be absolute clarity of what it means so that when people answer it, they are giving the right data. And then, uh, returning to the sex question, even though the piece of legislation we have in front of us doesn't address that, though I think there are issues with drafting that can maybe, if you've had a chance to look at the bill to that degree, you might want to comment on. Um, what was going to us was the, the bill team and, and the government argue that the first question, which is a binary question, is already a self-identifying question, and that the guidance that accompanied the 2011 um, census shows that we already have that that's the way the question is, is approached. Um, I suppose your response to that, and do you know if there was any consultation around the guidance in 2011, or was that, were you aware of the guidance we existed in 2011? Yeah, that's a, very, that's a very important point. I mean, certainly I, women's groups were not consulted on this, um, as far as we're aware. Um, I think it's something that slipped in under the radar and maybe it's an opportunity to break it back out again because whilst I'm sure there are going to be people who will answer um, <laughs> any question <laughs> in a way that's not in, uh, in a way that they interpret it's it's um, the idea that you can self-define sex has to be supported I think if we are going to change definitions of sex you are going to have to provide um, a body of evidence and get the Chief Medical Officer report, um, something from Chief Scientific Officer, and currently there is no scientific basis for arguing that there is any fluidity in sex, that there are any third, there is no third gamete, there, there are no human beings who have moved from one sex to another. Um, so it's, it, you know, there's, there's no real life teresius. It's not, it's not something that is, is possible within um, the human species and, yeah, and with the healthcare implications as I've said that, that, that your biology entails. Also I mean from a law point of view the law is very clear from the April Ashley case the Corbett and Corbett case in 1970 of um, a very sort of famous high society transsexual um, who married a man and they wanted to have the, the marriage annulled. She didn't want to get divorced. And the court looked at whether or not to annul the marriage on the basis that she was a male, and two males could not get married at that time under law, or whether to annul the marriage on the basis that um, they hadn't consummated the marriage. And it's, it's quite a short case, and it goes into quite a lot of detail as to that the, the judge was a medical man, and he looked into how do we define sex. And he says, look, sex is around biology, and there are three types. There's chromosomes, there's gonads, and there's, I'm sorry, it's early in the morning for this. Um, chromosomes, there's gonads, and there's genitalia. And sometimes you might only have two of the three. So he went into a lot around intersex, that some children are born with te internal testes and maybe an external vagina, and chromosomes are male. So slightly different to, to what the average or the regular would be, and talked about how one would have to maybe open up the vagina to allow testes to descend, but that doesn't stop a person being male because there's two of the three. He also talked about the psychological sex, which is transsexuals, um, or at the time the term used was transsexuals, uh, what we would now call gender identity or trans-identifying individuals. And he very clearly distinguished in law between biological sex and between what we would now call gender identity. That remains good law. If we look at the international level, the law remains that sex is biology. Um, sex is around chromosomes, and around gonads and genitalia. And so under international human rights obligations, whether it's the Convention on Eliminating Discrimination Against Women, whether it's the European Convention on Human Rights, the, the definition of sex is biology. To suddenly turn that around and say, we will now have male, female, and another category, or we will define sex as gender, is going against the law. And if we want to change the law, the way to do it isn't through um, conflating two things in a bill. It's through actually going through the processes of changing the law. 
Thank you very much. Kenneth Gibson. Yes, thanks very much. Just following on from what you've said, the witnesses to follow the Quality Network and Scottish Trans Alliance have given us a, a document, and in the evidence they've said, and I quote, a non-binary person is a person identifying as either having a gender which is in between or beyond the two categories, man and woman, as fluctuating between man and woman, or as having no gender, either permanently or some of the time. So... How do you feel about that? I mean, in the in the, the, the accuracy of that, uh, I think is that a reality by in your perception? I think you... gender is a social construct, and sex is biology. And so, if gender is a social construct, it's the norms that we expect from one another, that we've been socialised and raised with, that society expects from us, and that we learn very early on. No matter you know what we're learning at home, we learn from the world around us. If gender is a social construct, then of course. People's gender can be fluid. People's gender cannot exist. People's gender can change, right? Your sex is a fact. It's a biological reality. In the Netherlands, they have three genders available, right? Masculine, feminine, and X, non-binary. And I think many people would choose non-binary. Um, you can have your gender defined as X, non-binary, but that doesn't change your sex because your sex is a biological fact. Um, Personally, and from a legal point of view, there's no issue with how you want to define your gender, but gender is not currently a protected characteristic in law. So you can define your gender in any way, but your sex remains your protected characteristic in law under the Equality Act, and there remains exemptions for things like um, sex-segregated services. Yeah. And so it's just about moving them away from one another in order to define them. Now, do you have concerns about, if we don't get this right in your view, uh, that it will effectively undermine safe spaces for women, for example, um, and allow people uh, who are declared as women but are biologically male, no, no re gender reassignment, whatever, either um, through surgery or uh, uh, um, hormones or whatever, to be able to go to uh, all-women events and participate in all-women Issues, and do you think that's a, is that a concern for you in terms of how that might impact on, on a, women and girls? Yeah, it's a, it's a general concern. Obviously, it's not really within the scope of this bill. It, it comes really back to the. But I think this is the, the number of a lot of what but we're talking about. The, yeah, there's there's um, a conflation, as we said, between sex and gender, and for many people, it's it's for a lot of people, it's not an issue. For a lot of women, it's not an issue. But there are people who need protections and deserve protections and it's very important that that remains robust that that um, and sex is obviously a protected characteristic in Equality Act and um, we have seen recently quite a lot of conflation across um, especially councils this idea that it's about gender rather than sex and um, I think as part of a, a, a long-term project, it really does need, if we are going to start talking about gender and sex, we do need to be very, very clear where one applies and where the other applies, because otherwise it will create problems, and it will, it will unfortunately create problems for girls and w young women especially. Um, and, and I think, while I understand young women's urges to identify out of sex-based oppression by saying I'm non-binary. Unfortunately, I don't think the world works like that. I don't think they will benefit from being non-binary. I think, I think the men will benefit <laughs> from being non-binary. So it is really important that even though they might identify as non-binary, they are still protected if they are women on the basis that they will face discrimination and they may well face abuse because they are women. And, and do you, so do you feel, I know we're not going to have the question in this bill, but do you feel the question should perhaps be uh, voluntary questions on gender and, and sexual orientation, but the, 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 the compulsory question should be what was your sex at birth, for example, and that should be binary, male and female? Uh, I, yes, yes, but I, I wouldn't even say what is your sex at birth, because you can't change your sex, so it is what is your sex. So even this idea um, and this language, and I think discourse and language, particularly where it comes to a bill, is so important because it sets precedence. What is your sex is the same question as what is your sex at birth, because you cannot change your sex. Every part of your DNA has chromosomes which are the same chromosomes as when you're born. Um, I think having the mandatory question of what is your sex, male or female, 
and then voluntary questions around gender identity and sexual orientation will allow for data to be gathered around vulnerable groups, but also data to be gathered that will allow for how many ovarian cancer cases there have been and have they gone up or down that are actually based on biology, or will allow for data around refuges and domestic violence services, right, and how many need to be provided for people based on their sex, and also whether there needs to be additional services provided for people based on gender identity, or based on sexual orientation, or based on ethnicity, because we know that sometimes you need to have very specialist services within that group. Sorry, the reason I was asking at birth is because it's to really spell it out, if you like, because some people might say, well, I consider myself, to, they, they, might conf they, they themselves might conflate gender with sex, and if you don't actually make it absolutely crystal clear by saying at birth, but people themselves might decide, well, actually, I was, I was born male, but I consider myself to be female, yeah. Yeah. and they themselves yeah. mark the wrong box, and therefore we don't get the data that you're requesting. So it's just about, it's just a question of clarification uh, rather than yeah. anything else. No, no, I think that's true, and I think there will always be some people that say, even at birth, so even if you frame it in that way, mm. even at birth, I was, I was born in the wrong body, I have a different brain, or, you know, I... Mm. You know, I was the terminology is I was assigned this, right? As opposed to the the, the medical terminology, which is determined, right? Yeah. Um, but I think yes. I mean, it might be that there needs to be a clarification sentence saying this is what sex is, and this is what gender is. Um, I think it will be a small group of people, and there will always be people. Sorry, I know I'm on the record. There'll always be people that maybe don't tell full truths on a census, right? For whom there might be a, a question that's slightly political or that, you know. But I think having a clarification quest, uh, sentence will help the vast majority of people to realise which questions are relating to what. Um, and I think it's... I think most people will realise why it's so important to have the two questions. Thank you. Thanks, Kimbia. Thanks very much. Annabel Ewing. Yeah, to pick up on, on that point, good morning and thank you for coming in. Um, so the issue of, of the guidance, I mean, there is, as has been said already, guidance under the 2011 census uh, as regards the uh, mandatory sex question, which, as we have uh, established, is not actually a part of this bill, but it is a, a topic of discussion. Um, and the guidance is about self-identification. And so Mr Gibson suggested perhaps then a guidance could be amended to be sex at birth. And I hear what you say about that. Um, but what about then, you know, taking it out of what's in your mind, but just what the biology is, what your birth certificate says? Would that be an approach? Taking into account that, of course, this uh, is being sort of suggested on the basis that there presumably will be a voluntary question on gender identity, however that is, is phrased. So the two things kind of going in tandem, but in different parts. I suppose the problem at the moment in terms of birth certificates is everything's still up in the air around self-identification, the Gender Recognition Act, and, it, and if people can self-identify for the purpose of the Gender Recognition Act, then they are able to change their birth certificate, um, and that's not going to accurately reflect. So until we know what the outcome of that is, because we know that you know fewer than 5,000 people across the UK have applied for a GRC, which is about the numbers that, that were expected in 2004, but that could go up significantly if there are changes. Um, so yes, I think it would be a good idea once we know the outcome of that. <laughs> yes, because it all goes back, obviously, to numbers again and needing to have proper impact assessments because we just don't know what, what these numbers are going to be at the moment. We have no real research or evidence um, to suggest what, how that's going to pan out. And um, I think when the GRA was introduced, one of the arguments about it was that this was a very, very small number of people. It was the same argument th uh, that's been made with regards to this, that when it's such a tiny number of people, it's not going to impact the integrity of the data and it's not going to have a massive impact on society. But the argument was made that if this became more widespread, mm -hmm. then it would be problematical. And of course now we are in a situation where we don't know how widespread it's going to be. And so that does mean we do have to be very clear on, on definitions and what we are actually looking at. Uh, well, I hear what you say in that regard, uh, uh, and you know, just trying to, to find a way through all this, which is all very you know complex uh, stuff. Um, it, it may well be then that Mr. Gibson's suggestion is 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 perhaps the best way forward because your sex at birth is your sex at birth. 
and it is, uh, you know, the guidance is, is designed to try to be helpful to, to people who may, who may look at a question and think, I, I don't know what my answer should be to that, and then they can go and look at guidance, and the guidance can clarify what the position. So, I mean, in law, you know, to have a, a definition section is, is a quite normal approach to, to legislation. Uh, so, it seems then, in light of what you're saying, that that may be uh, a way forward in this debate. I think, um, I think that would certainly be in compliance with sort of international legal obligations, human rights obligations, um, in terms of sex being a protected characteristic. Um, I think it, it will frame it in a way that, that is people understand. people understand, yeah? Yeah, because okay. that's the other thing that I think people sometimes struggle with some of these, mm. <laughs> these ideas. Um, I think some of the definitions around gender identity are so broad mm. that we probably all fall under a, a trans description at some point. So, OK, well, yeah. that's interesting, thank you. OK, th thank you very much, uh, Ross Greer. Thanks, Convener. Um, I just quickly like to pick up on a point that um, Susan had just uh, made in, in relation to non-binary people who you would identify as, as being um, women, and you were talking about young women specifically. Um, does your point there not essentially boil down to removing their agency by saying that um, you know better who they are than they do? Um, no, I, I certainly don't want to get into, a, a, you know, it's, it's not about individual rights or individual choices. It's nothing to do with that. It's to do with um, science and what the needs of those people will be based medical medical needs apart from anything else if if you're a woman at some point you will need to have cervical screening done um and you know we, we saw recently that um the cancer research campaign for cervix havers or <laughs> whatever it was um there are people who struggle with those with that language there are people who struggle with medical terminology so um, it, that's why it's so important that whatever somebody's identity, and I, I have no issue with people having personal agency, of course not, that's, that's a basic tenet of our civilization. But um, there are going to be medical issues, and at some point they may need recourse to services. I think it's true, is it not, in Scotland, that um, women are the highest users of public service. And there are reasons for that, and those reasons don't go away based on how they perceive themselves. So um, it, it's two entirely different issues. I think you're conflating there, I'm afraid. I, I don't quite think that's the case, but to, I, I was glad Rosa mentioned intersex people, so I've got a specific question about that that I'd like to explore um, in relation to the, the question on sex. Now, obviously, some intersex people would be comfortable identifying, for example, in the census as being male or female. Uh, others don't think that's an accurate reflection uh, of them. Given that um, the census is about collecting data, for example, use in planning of healthcare provision, given that this is a community who often have quite particular healthcare needs. Does asking a sex question that only has male and female options not limit the uh, useful data collected that can be then used in, for example, healthcare provision? So, when it comes to intersex people, um, an intersex person will either have prostate cancer checks or will have cervical screenings, okay, because an intersex person will either be male or female will fall into one of the categories in terms of healthcare. Now, of course, there are complex um, needs, like every single one of us has, right? So for an intersex person, there might be complex needs. So some intersex females do not produce, uh, they produce testosterone, but don't use, their bodies can't regulate testosterone at all, right? So that's completely different to all of us in the room. Mm. But that doesn't stop that person being female and needing a cervical cancer screening. It means that they might need some additional healthcare based on that, that slight, difference in their chromosomes and in the way that their bodies balance. A little bit like my partner with asthma needs additional screenings in terms of lungs and capacity. But hold on, I'm going to, I'm going to finish um, and then I'll come back to you. Um, it's in terms of law, the law very clearly states that there is male and female. The medical evidence very clearly shows that there's male and female. Intersex is a ve slight variation on what might be the average male whatever that means, or the average female, but it's not a third sex. And in fact, many of the intersex awareness groups and campaigners have been very clear that they are not a third sex, that they are being co-opted and used in these debates in, in order to move political points 
or in order to try and promote um, changes to terminology and understanding that is not true and not based on medical evidence. Now, I am not an expert on intersex, and I am not myself intersex, and I will not speak for the intersex community, but I would strongly encourage you to read what they are saying, because their voices are not being heard, and they are being co-opted and used in a way that they are very angry about. We have, asked the, we have asked the intersex community for, for further evidence. In fact, we're receiving more okay. written evidence today, and, and we hope yeah, to hear from good, them. Because um, obviously just, it's Susan, just for, sorry. just for yeah. a second, um, just to stick with the, the point Rosa said, you mentioned those particular uh, needs. Do you have a, an alternative suggestion then for how we collect that kind of yeah. data to ensure that level of healthcare provision is uh, there? Uh, absolutely. Um, there's two countries where, where intersex has actually been foregrounded and really protected in terms of, in terms of you know, additional needs. And that one is Germany and one is Malta. And in neither of those countries have they said intersex is another sex category. But there has been a level of awareness raising, both in terms of intersex needs, but also in terms of, and, and we're now going completely off topic, the rights of children. Okay? You are a child born who is intersex, who has an intersex. Um, the agency of that child to consent, the choice of medical practitioners, the choice of parents, right? And these are, I mean, these are sort of complex human rights issues because do you, you know, the, the standard practice has always been that the doctors or the parents or between them or one or other chooses, but what about that child's right to choose? And are you allowed to intervene in that way? I think there's all sorts of questions around intersex that need to be unpacked across this country, across the UK, across Europe and they're not being addressed properly, but I don't think that this is to do with gender identity. I think intersex, which, which is a significant you know, population, I think 1.7, 1.8%. One in 60, yeah. Um, yeah more, it, the, the statistic I always hear bandied around is that there are more people born with intersex conditions than with red hair in the UK. And so, right, and so, <laughs> and I'm not saying that because... <laughs> yeah, no, I... Yeah. No, and I <laughs> but, um, but I think... I think there's absolutely a need to think about human rights and intersex individuals, but not in terms of gender identity, because it's not about gender identity. It's yeah, about it's about the, the, it's about medical. Well, it's about it's about medical, chromosomal, biological. Yeah, that's why I was asking about the sex question rather than separate yeah. issues of gender. But questions. it might be that it might be that you could put it in. It might be that you could have a question saying, right? So, what is your sex, male or female? Do you have um, do you have an intersex condition? Right? They might be like you might say, what is your gender identity or what is your sexual orientation? It could be another voluntary question if you're worried about data on intersex, but it shouldn't be lumped into the sex question. It ought to be part of the voluntary questions on what is your sex? That's your protective characteristic. What are your other intersectional needs, whether it's your sexual orientation, whether it's your gender identity, whether it's chromosomes? But then someone might say, well, why aren't you asking about all sorts of other medical needs that people are born with? So I don't know how far you want to go with this census in terms of drilling down into data. Because it does really boil down to that most intersex conditions are unambiguously male or female. They, they, they only affect... An intersex condition will only affect a male or will only affect a female. So we know it. And I think it's quite important not to other people to suggest that they are somehow not a proper man or not a proper man. I think that's it borders on some very difficult and um, potentially tricky territory if you if you try to tell people that they don't have that they're not quite uh, fully formed as a human being. It's not um, it's it's a medical condition. It's a medical um, condition of sexual development. It's not an identity question. So yeah I think Rosa's point about potentially having a a, a a backup, another another question is is possible to, if you, if there's a need to collect the data, but it probably it really does need to be done carefully so these people don't feel that they're being pushed into a third category, which they really shouldn't be in. I also think in terms of data, you know, we know that trans identifying individuals, we know that sexual orientation minorities, we know that people of ethnic minorities will face more discrimination, even though the law protects them, they'll face more discrimination, more vulnerability, right, than, than you know, your average straight white man. Um, do we know that about intersex people? I don't know, because it's not, it's not something, right, so this is about medical data, this might be about impact on, on, on yeah, health and well-being. Um, but if the purpose of having these additional questions, which are normally around the Equality Act, is around how do we protect vulnerable groups from marginalisation and discrimination. I think this is a question for you, because 
or well, Parliament, um, but, you know, whether or not you need that data on intersex. But uh, certainly from a, from a law point of view, it's, you know, having a third option of intersex goes against everything that the law says of what sex is. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Alexander Stewart. Thank you, convener. At present, you know, gender identity and sexual orientation, the data is used by local government and other public bodies uh, to fulfil their equalities duties. Uh, now, that data will continue to be collected, but if there is a change, then the implications for that within these organisations could be massive, depending on how that is progressed. I'd like to get some of your views on how you think that would be managed if that was the case. Um, well, that's really why we come back to having these questions, the integrity of these questions, yeah. because that is the point. It's, it comes back really to what is the census for. And if the census, as I'm sure you all agree, because it's, it's, a, it's a vast undertaking and it's an expense for government, so it has, to, it has to have a purpose. And that purpose really is to provide you all with the evidence you need to um, provide the services that the country needs. And if that becomes meaningless, then it's just an expensive exercise in um, self-validation for the person filling it in. Um, and I suppose it comes down to, well, what, 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 uh, what do you, really, yes, what the users need that data. And obviously, <coughs> if there is a need, and we do understand, you know, in a society that's becoming more and more diverse, there are going to be groups that have additional needs and that have different needs, and all these needs okay. will need to be considered by providers and they will need to be looked at. Um, but it just comes down to making sure that those services are properly targeted. Mm. So if people can say male or female and there's no guidance and it doesn't matter, then you're not able to capture the biological information, but you're also not capturing any information that you need to protect trans communities because you don't know when they've answered that question, male or female, whether that is their biological sex or mm. their self-identified gender. So, it's, yes, it's a really, really important yes. point. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Simeon. Thank you. Yes, could, could I perhaps um, go back to some of the questions that were asked earlier for a little bit of clarity, particularly in the questions uh, from uh, Kenneth Gibson, followed by Annabel Ewing, when you were talking about this, this uh, sex question um, and how... You define it if there's also a gender identity question, which is voluntary, and I think the issue of birth certificates um, came up. If the if the question said what is your birth sex, and had two options, would it be acceptable for the explanatory notes to to say uh, that this was a biological definition? Because people would get the opportunity uh, elsewhere in the census to ask about to ask answer questions about the gender identity. I think um, I think it's it's not just wouldn't just be appropriate. I think it's absolutely necessary that there is some clarity in the guidance notes that explains sex is biology, explains you know links to the law on on where we have definitions of sex, and then says and there are opportunities to discuss gender identity, which is about personal agency and about social constructs or however you frame that language, um, and to make it really clear. Why? Not just not just that these are two questions and what the questions mean, but I think it's really important for people to understand why, in these guidance notes, we have two separate questions, and that this is about being able to meet the needs of populations, and particularly vulnerable and marginalised groups, and that without this data being robust, we're not going to be able to meet those needs, and we're not going to understand the picture of what's, you know, the landscape that's, that's in front of us. Um, I think in many ways this this becomes deeply personal and politicised, these kind of questions, and taking it back that step and saying, if we don't have the data on, you know, the number of people whose gender identity does not match their biological sex, and we won't be able to understand the needs of that group, we won't be able to understand pay gaps of that group and discrimination and so on, actually depersonalises it and makes people realise that the purpose of the census isn't about self-validation. The purpose of the census is about being able to plan for populations and demographics and provide services that are needed. Okay. Thank you. And Sorry, Kenneth. Yeah, sorry. Just to, just, um, 
I, I think there's, there's, there's a kind of elephant in the room here that, that we're not really getting to, and I tried to touch on it in my original question, and that's the issue of women feeling safe, women's safety, etc. Um, and Dr Kathleen Stock, who's not actually here, said, and I quote, um, she, she basically talks about the sexual orientation question and said, basically, um, if we don't get this right, it will leave room for example, late transitioning male trans women who are heterosexual and have penises to self-describe as lesbians, which will leave the data not fit for purpose. Then these are the kind of things that we've seen in, in the, the press and media over recent months. Is this actually a concern that you have? We've not really heard if it is today, but I want to know if it is or if it's not. It is. A, it, it, obviously, it's a concern because... Um, and, but it, you know, we want to be very clear that we are not, and certainly not as a group, we do not believe that is the main reason or the um, majority reason why most people have issues around gender identity. For most people, this is something that is deeply held um, and that, that they, in many cases, have no control over. Most people are absolutely, you know, genuine in the... Um, in their gender identity, um, but there, it, there are concerns about people who will exploit any openings, and um, it, I suppose in this instance it makes the data, as Kathleen said, not fit for purpose. Um, the wider concern for society is that, unfortunately, there are individuals who you know, they will join the Catholic Church, they will become youth leaders, they will do anything um, to exploit openings. And that is, 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 is tragic and it's sad and it's no reflection on the broader trans community who are just the same as the rest of us and just want to get on with their lives and live as they, as they wish. But we have to be careful that in protecting one group of people we are not making another group vulnerable. And that's why it has to be got right, really, to make sure everybody is protected. I think where, um, where it comes to having data, both on sex and gender identity, that allows um, for planning, say, for prisons or for refuges to be able to have services that are sex segregated and that uphold the Equality Act, and also services that are that are gender neutral, essentially. That, and if people want to, women want to, trans identifying people want to come together in that space, you know, having the appropriate services that uphold the protected characteristics of everyone. Um, in terms of elephants in the room, um, we're going slightly away from, from the topic, but I'll address this in, in so far as saying gender identity or gender, being able to self identify, has come in in a number of countries around Europe over recent years. Um, do you mind if I veer off topic slightly to answer this? Um, you know, until about 2012, 2013, many countries in Europe, if someone wanted to transition, they were forced to be sterilised. Um, and that forced sterilisation happened in countries like Belgium, Croatia, Sweden, Denmark, France. Uh, we didn't have that in this country. We don't force people to be sterilised. It's a grave human rights violation. And um, a lot of the laws around self-identification of gender have been in order to remedy that grave human rights violation that was going on. In a country like Denmark, where there's six million people and self-identification came in in 2014 of gender, um, there are already cases of people who self-identified, I'm not talking about genuine people whose gender identity does not match the sex they were born in, people that self-identified as women and went into sex, well, previously sex-segregated spaces, now, you know, women's spaces, and rape people. And the six million people. And we're already having these cases in Denmark and in Norway. Um, in a country like Ireland, where self-ID came in, Ireland didn't even force people to be sterilised, they just didn't recognise that there was such a thing as trans, right, until they brought in self-identification law. Um, sex segregation remains in prisons, remains in schools, based on biological sex, not based on gender identity. Um, in Malta, where, the, you know, self-identification came in, there, if you are a trans woman and you go to a female prison, you have separate showering facilities and sleeping facilities, and prison guards can choose whether or not they search you if the prison guard is female. Um, these are really complex issues, and no one's getting them completely right, and no one's fully understanding them. In order to know what needs we have around prisons, we need to know how many trans identifying women there are in a population. We can't know that by conflating sex and gender in the census. In order to know 
about the needs of, say, refugees or girl guides or whatever it might be. We need to know the numbers of these populations. We need to meet their needs, but we also need to meet the needs of women and girls. You know, in England and Wales, two women are killed every week by a current or former partner. Every week. We need to think about the needs of women and girls as a protected characteristic under sex, as much as we need to think about the needs of trans individuals under the gender identity question. And I think very often these conversations focus in on the trans identifying individuals, and it's important, and they are vulnerable, and forget completely about the massive vulnerability of 50% of the population for whom sex is a protected characteristic for a reason. And that would come back to the prisons question, obviously, that uh, uh, Rose said you need the data for uh, prison populations, but we do know that, unfortunately, again, men are more likely to commit violent crime. Overwhelmingly, 98% of violent crime is committed by men, and we don't really see any change in male pattern violence. And obviously, that has become an issue with um, men who are placed in women's prisons, and they do tend to be more violent offenders and women's prisons aren't really equipped to cope with that. So again, that's something that you would have to consider when you're looking at data sets. Do we have to build different prisons or different prison wings? How are we going to accommodate? But unless you have the right data again, you don't know that. Yeah. And there's obviously been an issue with the girl guides, for example, about whether they allow in people who self-declare or not, etc. And is, is there a, how do you feel about well, the, about that? The issue with girl guides, for me, again, from, just from a law point of view, not an expert on girl guides, um, but the issue is not around. Some people have issues around whether um, a male teenager self-identifying as a teenage girl is in girl guides or not. I put that to one side. Girl guides has allowed. Girl guide leaders who self-identify, male-bodied people who self-identify as women, to then become leaders in the guides, and they have a policy where they do not inform the parents of the children that that leader is a, is a self-identified trans woman, and that leader may well be taking those children away, you know, whatever girl guides do for a week in, you know, forests or youth hostels, camping, exactly. Um, like I said, not an expert on girl guides. Um, <laughs> But they're not informing the parents. And these are children. And this is a safeguarding issue. And I, as a parent, want to be able to consent to my child being away in a mixed sex space, whether based on safety, whether based on religion, whether based on the fact that this is my child and my child is under the age of 16 and I have the right to be informed. So, but again, these, these become really complex issues because you, you have to say, well, if a trans woman has a right to a private and family life under Article 8 of the European Convention of Human Rights, would the girl guides be in some form of breach of, you know, their duty towards that trans woman um, if they were to inform the parent? I don't know. We haven't had a test case. I think the answer is don't have self-identifying trans women as girl guide leaders. Because if we're going to think about the proportionate and legitimate aim of having a sex segregated spaces in the girl guides, when we're going to think about the harms that potentially could be caused to the girls, not just over physical violence or safety, but also over excluding children who are from religious backgrounds, who would not be then allowed to join. Um, proportionate and legitimate aim is we keep the sex segregated girl guides. So, by, so keeping the, back to the census uh, convener, the, keeping this question simple and straightforward and binary, um, is essential. Yes, I think I yes, and um, any any other equality needs can be captured by additional questions. Okay, thank you. So, so, since we have since we have veered off topic. <laughs> Sorry, I would say um, I wouldn't just say it's essential in terms of capturing the data. It's also what's required under law. Yeah. So, so, so we have veered off topic. Can I ask, because uh, we're talking about safeguarding issues, has there been uh, any reliable data uh, captured on... You, you mentioned offending rates for both violent crime and sexual crime are obviously much higher amongst people of the male sex. We know that. That's a fact. Has any data uh, been captured on uh, self-identifying uh, trans women uh, who, who have... Uh, <laughs> 
uh, and their offending rates in these areas? Are they the same as men, or do they change to be the same as women's offending rates? So there was recently um, the Guardian had to retract um, something that Professor Stephen Whittle wrote uh, when we wrote six we wrote six legal opinions on the Gender Recognition Act for the Guardian maybe six weeks ago, two months ago, and Professor Stephen Whittle had put in that trans women have a lower offending rate, have the same offending rates as females. Um, a Swedish study has shown that trans women have the same offending rates as men. Uh, there is no difference in terms of violent offences as to whether or not someone has transitioned or self-identifies as trans or whether they remain a man having been born male. Um, the fact that The Guardian had to retract this and has changed it online is down to fair play for women who have brought out these statistics into the public realm. Now, part of those statistics might be that there are people who will self-identify as a woman in order to access female spaces, in order to offend, right? We're not saying that every trans individual, like I wouldn't say that every man is going to be a violent offender. We know it's a very small minority, right? Not all men and not all trans women, right? That being said, we can't take the individual, right, as um, taking away from the general rule. And the general rule is that women overwhelmingly are attacked violently by male-bodied people. And the male-bodied people are the overwhelming violent offenders, even if I imagine no male-bodied person in this room would ever dream of doing such a thing. We need to protect women from anyone that's male-bodied because of those violent offences. Thank you. Clear. Uh, just briefly, convener, as we've veered off topic, um, <laughs> well, I, I'm not, dis I'm not, dis I'm not, dis I'm not disputing the figures that you've gave, but you will also recognise that the trans community are often, more often, the victims of crime and have a high level of uh, physical and assault among the trans community that's perpetrated against them. Do you have any, uh, I mean, the concerns, the, the big debate is the Gender Recognition Act that's coming forward and what we're looking at today, which is around self-identification. Do you, um, and, and that's where the kind of debate is focused. Do you recognise that in some ways this might, well, I don't know, do you agree or not, that this detracts maybe from issues around uh, violence against the transgender, um, transphobia uh, against also the access to medical services, other issues that affect that community. The focus is very much on self-identification. Do you think the focus is in the right but, place? But, or? but that's, why, that's why we need to have two separate questions, because we don't have the data, and we all want the data, because we all, I hope, want to protect every vulnerable and marginalised person in our society. And we know that the trans population is a vulnerable and marginalised group in society. But if we don't have the data on how many trans-identifying individuals there are in a society, we can't understand what the discrimination is. We can't understand what the levels of domestic violence are, what the levels of suicide rates are, what the levels of violence in the street is, what the level of forced prostitution is. Um, if we conflate the two, we're never going to be able to meet the needs of this very marginalised group. And yes, of course, trans individuals face massive discrimination in society, without a shadow of a doubt, and violence. Women also do. Well, the reason I said that that rate of um, two women a week in England and Wales are killed by a current or former partner is this is not recognised enough. There have been eight trans individuals who have been killed over the last 12 years, and that's eight too many in the UK. And we, we know this from Trans Day of, of Remembrance. Um, we also know that there have been 12 murders carried out by trans-identifying individuals over that same period of time, and each murder is senseless and, and not right. We only have these few tiny figures because we don't have proper census data, right? So we're all grasping around in the dark trying to work out how to help a very marginalised community, but we don't know the size or the scale of the problems or of the community itself, which is why this could set, this bill could set a very good precedent for being able to capture proper data that's accurate. And whether, and whether there are differences within the community, because obviously there are so many different definitions of what constitutes um, a trans person, and there are um, within that there are biological males and biological females. So um, having robust data would, would break that out and be able to see which, which of the groups were at, at most risk and where that was problematic. I mean, actually... <laughs> One point about violence is that you, 
most likely to be a victim of violence as a man, in fact. I think that's true, is it not? That men actually, because men attack each other. Um, and, and uh, you know, that comes back to a broader societal issue that there's a problem with male violence that we need to solve. But we're not going to solve that problem of male violence by putting women at greater risk. We need to separate that out as well. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Just, just to kind of wrap up, unless there was any other members that wouldn't. Annabelle. So on the, going back to kind of the bill, and the, although it's been a very interesting discussion, and thank you for that, but the voluntary uh, question on gender identity. Now, I think some of the submissions at least have suggested that that's not terminology that's preferred, and they would rather have trans status or trans history or trans status slash history. Would you feel that that would capture all that we have been talking about today, or should that be one of a, a sort of subset of? I think because we, we do have to look at that yeah. issue, and that's what I we're think, tasked to do in getting back I to think the in bill. Terms, so. in, in terms of protected characteristics, in terms of quality acts, there ought to be a question on sex. There ought to be a question on gender reassignment, because these are protected in law. Gender identity like I said, has not been defined. It's not gender reassignment. It's much broader than that. Even Stonewall haven't defined it. They've just given us a list of who might fall under it, right? The, I think sex and gender reassignment probably need to be mandatory questions. Well, sex certainly, but gender reassignment as well. It's a protected characteristic. We can't elevate one protected characteristic to mandatory and leave one floundering as a voluntary status. Gender identity is not a protected characteristic. We need to capture data on this. But it can be voluntary, but there needs to be some form of definition or in the guidance notes, some form of explanation that your sex is your biology. Mm -hmm. Gender reassignment is if you've actually gone through the steps required and gender identity is something wholly different. Indeed, but when we get to that gender identity then, do we, you know, some of the submissions have suggested score out the phrase gender identity, insert trans status slash history? No, because trans status slash history, I suppose, is, um, is gender reassignment. That's, that's your trans status. Have you, have gender reassignment under the Equality okay, Act okay, is your trans you status, okay. whereas gender identity is, I think, something much, much broader. And I, I do recognise that there are plenty of submissions that don't want to include gender identity at all. Um, I think I've made it clear that I, that I think mm. it's an important one to include, as long as there's a definition. But, but the definition isn't your trans status because there are people who are non-binary and they don't have a trans status, but they would say that they're, but they would fall under this broad category of gender so identity. So should we seek to approach by way of a list then? A non-exhaustive non list? <laughs> <laughs> um, if I had the answer on how to define gender identity, um, I don't, I mean, I'm very happy to write to you afterwards and send okay. you a various different definitions of gender identity from various different jurisdictions and the international level and at the inter americas level and at the European level. Um, and you can decide which one you might want to adopt or which parts you do. Um, it's, it's a really tough question. The UN independent expert on protecting sexual orientation and gender identity minorities from violence and discrimination, which is a very long title, um, brought out a report in July 2018 looking at violence and discrimination against gender identity minorities. And he doesn't define gender identity. And I know him quite well. And he's very good. Um, we haven't, we haven't quite got there, so it might be that you have a non-exhaustive list. It might be that you have a, a sort of broad definition, um, bearing in mind that, you know, by the time that the census happens, there will be advances in how gender identity is understood, and, you know, I, I don't know how easy it is to then start amending mm. things. So. With that in mind, no, that's a reasonable point to look to the future. <laughs> um, we're running over. Did you? I think it's quite an important one, and I should have asked about it earlier. I think it was Susan Smith who talked to me. We were talking about intersex. He said that, uh, that intersex people uh, were being co-opted and used um, to advance. Maybe it was sorry, sorry it's Professor uh, Friedman. Um, uh, I'm just wondering who is using them and why, and what is the political agenda. So I think just to I clarify, think, a bit I think there's, that. Um, there's been quite a lot and. There's been quite a lot of um, intersex individuals and experts who work on intersex issues, so medical experts, saying that over the last few years, um, organisations or individuals who are seeking to advance the fundamental rights of trans individuals um, have started talking about that there is no such thing as two sexes, and then saying, because look, intersex people are neither male nor female. And that is not true. And it's also deeply offensive 
to people who are intersex, who are male or female. You know, intersex people can have children, can father children, right? You have to be male or female to do that if you were some sort of third space. Um, now, there, there has been quite a big pushback on this that intersex people say, we're not trans. There might be some intersex people who are trans, right? But they're not trans by virtue of being intersex. And that by co-opting intersex to say there is no such thing as two sexes because look at these kind of people that are somewhere in the middle, um, it's actually undermining the ability of intersex people to say, like I was talking about before, about human rights of children, to be able to advance their needs and, and that are based around being intersex. Yeah, yeah, but what would be the purpose of anyone pursuing that agenda? Um, well, the purpose is that there are, there are experts and groups out there who want to conflate sex and gender, because currently under the law, you can have sex-segregated spaces. So even if someone has a gender recognition certificate, someone is trans, um, they're, uh, they're not allowed to access certain sex-segregated spaces. These organisations have therefore said, if we can get rid of the idea of sex, of two sexes, we can get rid of that protected characteristic, essentially, in fact, right? And we can call everything around gender. And in order to try and get rid of sex, they can't get rid of sex in terms of the law. So they've either used the words interchangeably in policies, so we've seen this in NHS policies where the NHS has been advised to use the word gender, not sex, and suddenly we've got mixed sexed wards because they are gender segregated and self-IDing and all sorts of problems. Um, or they've been trying to say, well, there's no such thing as just the two sexes. So they've co-opted the intersex community who fall into male or female and said, look, if we have intersex, then it must be that sex is a spectrum. And if sex is a spectrum, then we can all fall anywhere we want and then we can all walk into any spaces we want to. That's what I meant by co-opting. OK, thanks for that clarification. Then we're going to have to wrap up now, but I just wanted to ask you one specific question about the census question, just for, for clarity. And it's this... Um, this third option in, the, in proposed third option in, in the sex question, um, in addition to the gender identity, let's call it the gender identity question, um, when the Scottish Government or the National Records of Scotland consulted on this, certain stakeholders said that in addition to a gender identity question, there had to be a third option for non-binary people in the sex question. But when, when I looked at Stonewall's definitions of trans non-binary is one of the, the it comes under the trans umbrella, as they call it. So I take it that it would be acceptable to move for non binary people to identify themselves in that other gender identity question away from the sex question. Do you see what I'm saying? Very clearly, as we've said all along, you know, that sex is, is dimorphic, and that, that's, yeah. that's it. Um, non binary Stonewall do list as a um, under their trans umbrella, and it is an identity issue. It doesn't change your fundamental... But there are non-binary women who get pregnant and there are non-binary men who father children, and, and they still need the same screening programmes, as we've said, and there still needs to be consideration, you know, if they commit a crime, which prison population they go into. That is not going to change. The non-binary option doesn't transform their physical being yeah. into something else. So it, it, it definitely falls within the identity umbrella rather than the sex okay. question. Yeah. Can I thank you both for um, coming to give evidence today? And now we will have a brief suspension before we change panels. Thanks. <laughs>
I would now like to welcome our second panel. Uh, we are joined by Vic Valentine, the Scottish Trans Policy Officer for the Scottish Trans Alliance, and Tim Hopkins, uh, the Director of the Equality Network. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, for coming to give evidence today and also for your written uh, submissions. Um, I don't know if you were here for the first, um, uh, the first evidence session, so um, I'd like to ask something re relating to that. Um, in the uh, stakeholder um, exercise that the National Records of Scotland carried out, um, they asked people about uh, a gender identity question, although I know that the terminology around that is changing, and also about uh, the, the sex uh, question um, in the census. Now, um, as well as the proposal to have a gender identity question, which is voluntary, um, your group also wanted uh, a third option in the sex question. Um, can you explain uh, why, why you argued that particular position? Uh, yeah, sure. So we already know uh, from the guidance from the last census that trans people were supposed to answer the sex question in line with their self-identified sex. So for trans men, they were able to select male regardless of their biological sex characteristics at birth and regardless of what was on their birth certificate, and trans women were able to select female. Um, so we were really happy with that approach to it. Um, but for some trans people, non-binary people, uh, they were then left without being able to make an answer to that question in the same way, essentially unable to answer it truthfully or in line with how they live and identify. Um, so I'm a non-binary person, um, and if I were to receive the census and there were the, only those two options, I would feel really unsure or uncertain of kind of what exactly was the right way to respond, what one would be truthful, what one would provide NRS with useful information about who I am or how I live, because I don't feel like either of those, of those options would. Um, and we did, a, a big um, survey with non-binary people back in 2015 where we spoke to about 900 people across the UK um, and we asked them about how they kind of felt about the fact that forms often did only provide these these two male and female options um, and people were felt that it was um, it was something that reminded them of a lack of inclusion and recognition of society and three quarters of people said that they wanted to be able to um, use tell tell people in complete forms using terms that described how they actually lived, um, and about 68% said that they wanted that to always include a kind of third other option. Um, so we just feel that in order to maintain the data set of the sex question, which is very clearly told trans people that they should be responding to it in line with how they live and identify, that we need to add a third option to make sure that that doesn't only apply to trans men and women, but also applies to non-binary people as well. Yeah. Um, but you heard me saying at the end of the last session that under the Stonewall definition of the trans umbrella, non-binary is part of that trans umbrella, and uh, the argument was made that it's non-binary is a, 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 an identification as opposed to biological sex. And now that we've got this different from the 2011 census, now that we've got this other question about identification, um, the, the sex question could capture identity about biological sex, which is important for health data and so on, and you would have the opportunity to express your identity, whether non-binary or whatever, under this other voluntary trans question. So the, the voluntary question that's currently proposed isn't designed to ask you about your identity again. It's supposed to ask you about whether or not you are trans or have a trans history. So if you imagine that all people living and identifying as women would tick the female box at the sex question, so that would include trans women and all other non-trans women, and then there will be an additional question that says, do you consider yourself to be trans or to have a trans history? And then all trans women would tick yes at that question. So it wouldn't ask you again, how do you think of your gender identity and have a sort of male, female, non-binary option? It would be saying, do you consider yourself to be trans or have a trans history? So the sex question is about what is your self-identified sex? How do you live and identify? And the trans question, which is called gender identity in the bill, but is actually a trans status or a trans history question, then goes on to ask you if you are a trans person. So you can still, by using those two questions together, clearly identify which people who say female are trans women and which people who say female aren't, but it's, it doesn't repeat a question to ask about your identity, mm. if you see what I mean. 
So how do you respond to the arguments that it's important to capture data on biological sex? Um, because what you're proposing doesn't, will not capture 100% accurate data on biological sex. It will capture completely accurate data for biological sex characteristics at birth for probably just over 99% of people, because for almost everybody in Scotland, their biological sex characteristics at birth and how they live and their self-identified sex now are totally the same. Um, of course, the sex question is massively important for things like health planning, but sex is only a proxy for making decisions about sex-specific services. Don't get me wrong, it is a completely useful proxy, but for example, not all females need cervical screening because they may have had hysterectomies, and we can't tell that just by knowing that they're female, that they'll automatically need cervical screening. And actually, for trans people, sex is a much less useful proxy. Whether you ask about their biological sex at birth or how they're currently living and identifying, many of us have medical transition treatments, many of us make changes to our bodies. So actually, just asking what our sex characteristics were when we were born doesn't give you current up-to-date information about our health needs. For example, of you know, a much larger proportion of trans men will have hysterectomies as part of gender reassignment treatment. So actually to count them and insist that they label themselves as female in order to count them for cervical screening is not actually going to be useful because so many of them will not have the body you would anticipate if you assume that all female, all people who select female at that question automatically need cervical screening. Mm. Sorry, uh, Tim Hopkins. Um, can I first of all say thank you very much to committee members for allowing me to come along at the last minute to replace my colleague Hannah. Unfortunately, her father was taken seriously ill last night, so she wasn't able to come. But I'll do my best to answer the questions. Um, Vic's already explained that uh, the data you would get from a question that insisted that people responded according to the sex they were assumed to be at birth by their appearance, that the data you would get, call that biological sex, uh, isn't really any different for health planning purposes than the data you would get, for, or you got in 2011 from the question as it was in 2011, which was effectively a self-identified sex question. As you've already heard, the 1% of people who were trans were told in 2011 to answer it according to the sex that they believed themselves to be. And in fact, ONS issued guidance for the England and Wales census for, 20, for 2001, saying exactly the same thing. So this has been going on now for two decades. You don't get data that's significantly more useful for health planning if you do ask about biological sex than if you do what we did last time and the time before. Um, there's another issue as well. Uh, the committee has heard that biological sex is what's protected by the law. That's actually not true. If you read the guidance that the Equality and Human Rights Commission publish about the Equality Act and about the sex protected characteristic, uh, it focuses on legal sex. And legal sex and what you've heard called biological sex are not the same thing. Uh, one of the previous witnesses referred to a case four decades ago about a trans woman called April Ashley. But the law has changed a lot since then. The European Court of Human Rights ruled in cases called Goodwin and I versus the UK back in 2002 that it's a human right to have your gender identity as a trans person recognised and you have the right to change your legal sex to match your gender identity. And that's what the Gender Recognition Act does. Uh, as a result of that case, it was brought in in the UK. The UK was one of the last countries in Europe to do that. Uh, and came in in 2005. Since then, of course, anybody who's applied for and got a gender recognition certificate, their legal sex is different from their biological sex, from the sex that they were assumed to be when they were born. Uh, and it's their legal sex that is protected under the, uh, under the Equality Act. Right. So, Thank you for that. Um, so do you think that biological sex is of, of any relevance whatsoever? A biological sex characteristics are certainly important for health care. If you have a cervix, then you may need cervical screening. But as Vic has already said, forcing trans men to call themselves men in the census under a biological sex question would not help you with your health services planning because many trans men have had hysterectomies, so they do not have a cervix. The, the, as Vic said, 
information you get about sex in the census is very useful for broadly planning these things, but in, you have to take into account individual circumstances as well. And individuals, for all sorts of reasons, may or may not need that service. So other women who've had a history. I mean, I'm just trying to kind of pin down your organisation's kind of view generally of, of, of sex as a protective characteristic, because I know that in, um, when you made a submission um, to, I think it was Scottish Trans Alliance actually, when you made a submission to the 2015 uh, uh, select committee in Westminster, the Women in Equalities Committee, that was looking at all these issues. Um, your submission argued that um, sex should no longer uh, be, sex exemption should no longer figure um, in things like uh, hiring people for particular jobs. Um, I can um, read it out. I've got it. Yes. Uh, it's not our position at all that, that that's the case. Um, there are specific exemptions in the Equality Act that allow you, for example, in a sex-segregated space or in a sex-exempt job, the presumption is that a trans person for those spaces and jobs will be treated in the gender they live and identify as unless these specific exemptions are invoked. So, for example, women-only services, sex, sex female sex-only services are presumed to be inclusive of trans women unless specific exceptions are used. We don't think that it should be necessary to exclude trans people exclusively on the basis that they are a trans person. We think that if you take a person-centred approach to service delivery and you think that an individual is genuinely unsuitable for your service, that there, we don't see why there would be an instance where just because a person is trans, that would be the thing that made them not suitable. We absolutely support the maintenance of women-only spaces and roles that are just for women when those are important, absolutely. But I think what you're saying is that these sex-exempt jobs, for example, support workers for someone who was disabled delivering intimate services. I think it's to, so that people have a choice to say that they don't want a person with a male body performing these intimate services. But my understanding was that you argued against that in 2015. <coughs> We think that anyone should have the right to refuse any individual when it comes to something like intimate health care if they don't feel like that person would be able to do that in a way that felt respectful and useful for them. And we, don't, we would see no purpose in forcing somebody to be provided care by someone that they didn't feel comfortable with. Right. So why did you argue against sex exemptions in 2015? It's... I, su I suppose the position was more specifically that we didn't think that trans people should not be included in line with their identity in absolutely all circumstances. And we thought that there were clearly cases where trans people would be appropriate people in order to take these sorts of positions in line with their identity. So it was more about it not being invoked in a blanket way, I suppose. OK, thanks. We'd better move on, uh, Claire Baker. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, the proposal in front of us for the census amendment suggests that we put questions on sexual orientation and gender identity into a voluntary category along with religion, which is already there. Um, from the submissions, you're uh, supportive of that proposal. Do you want to just say a bit about why you think it's important they go into the voluntary part of the census? Uh, yeah, obviously, um, we're still some way from complete equality for lesbian, gay and bisexual people, and rather further away from complete equality for trans people. Uh, and I think for that reason, to force somebody on pain of a £1,000 fine to specify to the government what their sexual orientation is, for example, uh, would not be appropriate at the current time. Uh, so that's why we think the question should be voluntary. We, we often recommend to people who are collecting sexual orientation data for uh, employment monitoring purposes or whatever, that you have a prefer not to answer uh, option yeah. in, the, in the answers. It's equally good to specify that the question is going to be voluntary at the top of the question, which is what NRS recommends. Yeah. Do you think, because I think one of the submissions said if the questions are voluntary and people might not want to answer them, they might not feel comfortable answering them, should we bother asking them at all? Are we going to receive helpful data from the question in that? Um, yes, definitely. Uh, the, the Scottish Government have been asking a sexual orientation question in their national surveys now since 2011. Uh, and they published data in 2017 based on the 2016 surveys. 
uh, there are about 20, 21,000 people, I think, were asked questions in 2016 in those surveys. And you get some useful data out. You get some information about how many lesbian, gay, bisexual, or other sexual orientation people there are. And uh, they got two statistically significant facts from that sample of 21,000 people. One was that lesbian, gay, bisexual, and other sexual orientation people have rather worse health than the general population. And the other, I think, was to do with uh, people being more likely to live in areas that are, that are deprived areas. But the amount of information you can get out that is statistically significant is not much out of a sample of 21,000 people. The big advantage of asking the questions in the census is that you have a sample of 4 million or so adults and you get much, much more useful information. So, yeah, we know that there will be some under-reporting, but, for example, you can still tell the difference between how many lesbian, gay, and bisexual people there are living in Glasgow compared with the number who are living in Inverness, and that kind of thing is important for uh, the provision, the planning of services. We know that people move around the country. So even though there is a level of under-reporting, you still get really important data. And you can still tell, for the people who did report themselves, as, for example, lesbian or gay, you can tell, for example, what their health outcomes are like compared with people who reported themselves as heterosexual, even though there is some under-reporting in the lesbian and gay cohort. Uh, now, the bill describes it as gender identity. Um, the submission from yourselves suggested that should be called um, trans, a trans status question rather than a gender identity. And we've heard from the previous panel their concerns about lack of definition around gender identity. Obviously, if we take the bill as it's presented to us, that would then be on the face of the bill as a description. Um, do you want to say a bit more about why or what you feel about the use of gender identity and do you think it should be changed? So I think it's my understanding that because this one is mostly about deciding whether the sexual orientation and gender identity or trans status question is voluntary, that they're able to define it in a broader way and it won't be until the regulations come out about the actual wording of the questions that that will de determine actually how that they're, they're asked. It's definitely NRS in their latest round of testing are very much testing a question that is, do you consider yourself to be trans or have a trans history? But certainly I think that if it would be useful and provide greater clarity to have the way the question is described in the bill more closely match what the wording of the question would be, then it could be worth thinking about changing that. But I also think that gender identity is sort of broadly used to refer to the strand of equality work that just focuses on transgender people. So I believe that that's why that was the decision to use this, because there's nothing to say that as data needs change, the sorts of questions that NRS might want to ask trans people within a census might change, and then they won't have to revisit the parliament every time in order to be able to then request that those questions are voluntary. So it was my understanding that it was to sort of say there will be a question that pertains to transgender equality we will call this question gender identity but the actual question we will ask in the 2021 status is a trans status trans history question mm -hmm. and we would say that uh, gender identity is a very widely used term for example by the united nations they talk about sexual orientation and gender identity when they're talking about discrimination against lesbian gay and bisexual and against transgender people. So we think gender identity is okay as the headline term for this. And just as with other subjects in the census, the detailed questions are considered later and there'll be statutory instruments around those. Uh, so we'd be comfortable with the bill staying as it is, although we would prefer to see the question being more specific and NRS continuing to do testing to find the best question. Okay, and one final, just a brief question. The submissions um, from yourself did often describe the trans population as, as so small and it's a, and also a relatively small number of non-binary people, uh, kind of arguing that if people were able to have this flexibility around the sex question, if we were to go down a non-binary route, that the figures are so small it wouldn't really impact much on data. Do you see any, I suppose in the wider debate, there's a kind of discussion around um, a generational shift that maybe the next generation come along have a different attitude to these things than than my generation now I fall into that category yeah. <laughs> um, do you think that would be tracked by the same? I suppose it's just a question whether you know you describe it it's, it's often it's emphasized it's a small amount it's such a small um the general discussion seems to be that actually there's an increasing amount there's a younger generation that have a different view of uh, do you have 
I don't know. Do you have any views on that? Is that do you do you still maintain that it's a small population and it wouldn't affect any of the data to an extent? The because the zero point six percent estimate that we use comes from a Williams Institute paper that drew together a large number of state level surveys done across the US and kind of pooled all of the figures that they found to come out with this average across the US. That would be. 0.6%, and that was done and published relatively recently, and I don't think that there has been such an enormous shift that we would anticipate seeing a, a figure much bigger than but that overall. 0.6%, and was that people who had transitioned, or was it No, so those are all state-based surveys that just ask a self-identified sex question. They allow someone to self-identify what their, how they describe their identity and also whether or not they're trans. Thanks very much. Uh, Tavish Scott. Yeah, I'll move from one generation to, uh, to another. Um, uh, <laughs> there's, a Roger Daltrey, there's a Roger Daltrey <laughs> a lyric in there somewhere. Um, I just wanted to go back, uh, Tim Hopkins, to a point you made to the convener earlier on, and I may have just missed this altogether, but I think you said uh, about the law and the definition law that uh, I think, you, if, if I may say so, you contradicted the earlier panel about the definition. Could you just say, I, I missed that. Could you explain that again, please? Um, yes, uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission are very clear that when the Equality Act talks about sex, it's primarily talking about your legal sex. And your legal sex is not the same as your biological sex when you were born, uh, because people can change their legal sex using the Gender Recognition Act. There's another important point as well, and that is when we're talking about discrimination against people, which is what the Equality Act's about, Every protected characteristic, you're protected not just if you have that protected characteristic, but also if people think you have that protected characteristic. So if somebody thinks that you're gay but you're not and discriminates against you because they think you're gay, then that's sexual orientation discrimination. The same applies to sex discrimination, which means that if you're a trans woman, for example, who does not have a gender recognition certificate, so you're still legally a man, but you're discriminated against at work because you're a woman, mm. because you live and present as a woman, mm. then that is sex discrimination under okay. the Sex Discrimination Act, regardless of the fact that you're not legally a woman and certainly regardless of what your biological sex was at birth. So the definition of sex in the Equality Act is much more complex than... Uh, than even legal sex, and it's certainly not okay. biological sex. No, thank you for that. And does that matter in this context of the census? What is, that, what is the import of that to our discussion about the census? I mean, that, that's a good question, because the data from the census is used for different purposes. Yeah. Uh, and one of the purposes it's used for, for example, is a baseline for data, data that is collected by other bodies. And generally speaking, other bodies, when they collect sex data, do collect mm. lived sex. Yeah. They yeah. don't ask... Uh, personal details about your genitals or biological sex. Um, data is also useful for measuring the amounts of discrimination. And I would say that discrimination you face, you face according to the, how you live your life and how you present and how you're, how you're believed to be. So if you're a trans woman who lives as a woman uh, and presents as a woman, you will be treated as a woman and you will face discrimination as a woman. Uh, if you're a trans man who lives and presents as a man, you will not face misogynistic discrimination because you're treated as a man. So in terms of measuring the impact of discrimination, it's actually lived gender, lived uh, self-identified sex, the sex that you live as, which is the important thing. Um, earlier this year, this parliament passed the Gender Representation on Public Boards Act. Uh, and that act requires, as you know, public bodies to uh, push their boards up to 50% at least women. Uh, and, and that definition then defines women as including trans women who are living as women. Uh, so it would be rather strange, I think, in terms of getting baseline data, if the census asked for something different than that, uh, because th th that is what we're aiming for. We are aiming for our public boards mm. to have at least 50% women, and the Parliament has already decided that that should include all women who are identifying as and living as women, including trans women. And we believe that the census should ask for the same thing. If I could make one other point on that answer. Our colleague, James Morton, uh, who is manager of the Scottish Trans Alliance, is a man. Uh, some of you here have met him. He looks like a man, he acts like a man, he is a man. I think anybody who's met him would think it would be quite ridiculous if he had to fill in the census form saying that his sex is a woman. 
But that is what he would be forced to do if you have a question asking about biological sex at birth. I think it would be very retrograde. It hasn't happened for the last 20 years. James filled in his sex as male when he completed the census in 2011. I don't think he should be forced to effectively lie and say that his sex is female on this census. No, that's very helpful. And, and your, your main contention is that we should be consistent, I um, suppose. I, I do think consistency is yeah. really important from census yeah. to census. Yeah. So I think the data will be more consistent if you stick yeah, with uh, lived sex. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Annabel Ewing. Good morning, uh, gentlemen. Thank you for coming in. Um, yeah, on the, I mean, a number of issues, uh, important issues raised. Um, are you saying, then, just picking up the last point, that you're, what you're saying is then that the status quo should prevail in that the, uh, although it is, I mean, to, to make the point that the bill actually is not about the mandatory question, the bill is about the voluntary part, but obviously the discussion has gone wider. Um, but is your position that the, the mandatory question should uh, remain the same? So there should be male, female, and the guidance indicating the issue of self-identification. Is that your position, in light of what you've just said? Or? Not, not quite. Do you want to go first, Scott? Luke? Yes. Um, it almost, but we want there to be the third option added to allow non-binary people to also answer in line with their self-identified sex. So we're very happy for the sex question to remain compulsory. It's massively important for all kinds of planning and measuring inequality. We're very, very happy for it to be compulsory, but I want to be able to answer that sex question in line with who I am, how I live and how I identify, and I want to be given the opportunity to answer that in the way that all other men and women are able to answer it. And in terms of the discussion that we had with the first panel, um, you know, the one suggestion uh, in terms of a way forward was to reflect these uh, issues of self-identification in the voluntary uh, uh, section of the census uh, uh, and for the, the reasons that were discussed at some length in the first panel and the issue of, of gender identity as a social construct, the issue of biological sex, sex at birth uh, and so forth and the issue of, of data for, uh, that can be used to the, the best possible advantage including for people that will uh, answer different questions about self-identification to ensure that that data is actually captured properly as well. Would that approach then not uh, fulfil those objectives, i.e. have the mandatory binary sex question and have the voluntary gender identity question, uh, however that is defined, and I'd like to get onto that in a minute, but would that not capture the data to the best, which is the purpose, in fact, of the census? So I think that there's the option that we support, which is that there should be the mandatory sex question with three options that trans people can answer in line with their self-identified sex. So it wouldn't be a sex at birth question. And then there would be a gender identity question that was actually a trans status and history question that asked, do you consider yourself to be trans or have a trans history? That would capture that what proportion of people who answer female at the sex question are trans women and weren't female at birth and what proportion of the people who select male are trans men and it would also allow non-binary people to tell you that they are neither men nor women they are non-binary and you can figure out what proportion of and but if you were to introduce a mandatory sex at birth question male, female, and then also a second question that asks, what is your self-identified gender or what is your self-identified sex? And that then said male, female, non-binary. Although you would have a similar output in terms of, yes, you would be able to identify which people there was a change between, in that second option, you do f you force people to reveal quite private and personal information about their biology that isn't necessarily relevant, as we've already discussed, around things like health planning. And I think the principle of trans equality and the movement towards trans equality in politics has been to say that how you live and identify should be respected and is more important than reducing you simply to your biological characteristics at birth. I don't think anybody's trying to reduce anybody to anything. I think we're just trying to work our way through this. And, you know, we have heard very strong uh, evidence this morning that uh, sex is a biological condition, it's a biological fact as of sex at birth, okay? Uh, and, you know, how people choose to live their life is absolutely a matter for them and they should be free to do so. But, the, the, you know, the, the immutable fact is, in terms of the evidence we've just heard, that sex is a biological fact. And what we all, I hope, would be seeking to do is to get to a position that respects people's 
uh, uh, rights and people's identities, yeah. and also you know respects other people's rights and identities, including implications that. Uh, a, a different approach may have for other groups of people, including, of course, uh, as has been mentioned in the earlier session, women and girls. And I think that's what we're all really trying to, to get towards. Uh, and in that regard, uh, having the mandatory question uh, remain a binary question and having a gender identity question as a voluntary question, trying to capture uh, other uh, uh, positions, other uh, self-identifications in order to get the correct data seems to me to be uh, have some rationale to it. In regard to the gender identity issue in terms of definition, so it seems from what Vic is saying that this has been preordained by NRS to be uh, just uh, to do with trans uh, identification. I mean, it's this parliament ultimately that you know is looking at the bill and will have a view on, on different terminology used. But it, it, it may be, therefore, that that would, would exclude other people. So how do you deal with that in the gender identity voluntary bit? You know, if you just, if your view is that this actually is interchangeable with a trans status, if you like, what about other people who, who, who are not in that position and that self-identify in some other capacity? What, what about them? Should the gender identity therefore not be a wider uh, definitional uh, approach, involve a wider definitional approach? It's, a, it's an open question. I'm just seeking your, your views. I'm not. I'm not sure if I, if I totally understand. Are you asking if there should be more options other than just three for people to be able I'm to say? I'm talking about the voluntary uh, part of the, the census, as proposed, to include a question on at the moment in terms of yeah. bill. It's the word. The wording uses gender identity. Yeah. Now you've made some statements to the effect that you feel that actually what is being intended further to your work with NRS is actually it's, it's a question about trans identification. But I'm asking then the question that, assuming uh, for the sake of argument that we have a mandatory binary question on sex, yep. would therefore this not be an opportunity in the voluntary uh, question on gender identity to capture uh, non-binary, to capture other people, as opposed to just trans? That's really the question. So which other people do you think that you would like it to capture other than trans Well, I'm people? asking you the question. Would there be other categories of people, non-binary, for example, that might want to, to, to make that point in that part of the census? I, I think I think the key point here is, is that, that this is about the protected characteristic. So the protected characteristic is called in the Equality Act gender reassignment. Uh, in some other countries, it's called gender identity. When the Equality Act went through at Westminster, the UK yeah, government I, said sorry, they were the same. I'm not because I'm conscious of time. I'm not talking about the mandatory part at the moment. I'm just talking about the voluntary yeah, part. So, so, that's so what gender I, identity. Yeah. Sorry, that's what I meant. So, so the purpose of the voluntary question is to capture people who are affected by the protected characteristic for gender reassignment so that all of your protected characteristics are covered. Now, we think we've done quite a lot of work with asking trans people, that they are the people who have the protected characteristic of gender reassignment, including non-binary people. We've done quite a lot of work asking people about what question do they think would suit, what would they answer, and so on. And we think the question that says, uh, was the effect of do you identify as trans or have you identified as trans in the past, is the best way to capture those people who have the protected characteristic of gender reassignment. We think it's easier to understand than saying, do you have the protected characteristic of gender reassignment, which is quite legalistic. So we're not totally wedded to the wording that NRS has proposed at the moment, but it is all about capturing those people, trans people, how many trans people are there, those are the people who are affected by the protected characteristic of gender reassignment, just as you do for the other protected characteristics. So coming back to the sex question for a moment, the crucial question here is, should that be about biological sex? Should it ask about legal sex? Or should it ask about the, ask about the sex that you live as? We are absolutely clear, in our view, that asking about the sex that you live as will First of all, be consistent with the previous censuses. Secondly, give you the most useful information for the reasons that we've already discussed. And to not do it would also be an invasion of privacy. The European Court of Human Rights has been very clear that the reason trans people are allowed or have the, have the ability to change their legal gender 
is to protect their privacy and asking people about their biological sex characteristics when they were born is a breach of their privacy. So at the very least, the question should ask about legal sex and not about biological sex so that it protects people's privacy in the way that the European Court has been very clear it should be protected. But in our view, it's consistent with other legislation and with the previous two censuses to actually ask about, uh, to ask about how you live your life, about your self-identified lived gender, the gender you interact with other people in. Okay. Can I just do a quick supplementary to that? How do you live as a particular sex? How... Yeah, I mean, I think that that's... I want it to be very clear that we do not have a kind of stereotype of what it means to live as a woman or to live as a man, and that we feel that if you do the things in category A, then you must therefore identify as well and vice versa. We know that men and women can live in a huge variety of different ways. But for trans people, I'm a trans person, it is about a deep held sense of discomfort with knowing that other people who you interact with have a different sense of who you are from, from who you feel yourself to be and wanting to take steps and make efforts to make it clear to other people that despite the assumptions that they might make about you, those aren't things that feel like they line up with your identity and you want them to, um, to be able to see that it's meaningful to you that the way you feel about your gender and I'm how you live your life is different. I'm just trying to kind of like really drill down on your how does one f how does one live as a particular sex, as Tim said, is sort of, you know, like, without resorting to gender stereotypes? No, well, I think most people, when they talk to other people, they, in some sense, present themselves either as men or women. They expect that the other... When, when I speak to another person, I expect that they will assume that I am a man, and I don't contradict that. I use he pronouns about myself, and I'm comfortable for other people to call me he, him. If I was a trans woman, then I would obviously want other people to call me she and her, like any other woman does. So really, I'm talking about those kind of interactions. Uh, we, we live in a gendered world, and when we interact with other people, one of the first things we think about is their gender. So it would be based on things like clothes, for example? Um, it doesn't have to be, of course, because many uh, 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 people wear all sorts of clothes and, and you know, oh. gone are the days, thank goodness, when women, when it was thought strange that a woman wore a pair of trousers. So the fact that you wear a pair of trousers doesn't stop you being a woman and it doesn't stop yeah. a trans woman being a woman. Yeah, so, it, still, it, so, 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 so what is it then? What is it to live in a particular sex then? If it's, if it's not about that, what is it? It, it, it's about your self-identity and the way you express that self-identity to other people. Well, uh, I am a man. I've always known that I was male. I believed I was a boy when I grew up. And when I interact with other people, uh, I'm happy to discuss the fact that I'm a man. In fact, I'll assume that most people will assume that I'm a man when they talk to me. And if, if subjects come up, as I say, people will use he pronouns for me. I don't find that a problem. It's just, it's, it, it kind of strikes me we could go down the road of male and female brains, which, you know, for many feminists is something that's quite anathema, that, you know, like, internally we're all human beings, not male or female. Yeah, no, I... And I totally agree, and we very much don't think that gender stereotypes define a person's gender identity. There was nothing about my interests, my likes or dislikes, my personality, that meant that I couldn't be a woman or grow up and live as a woman, as we would have expected based on what my body looked like when I was born. But actually, the idea of that to me felt wholly impossible and suffocating and I just knew that that wasn't who I was and I think it is a very difficult um, sense of certainty about that discomfort to be able to convey to other people because I appreciate that for the vast majority of people it's just an automatic thing and it isn't something that requires but I think it, it's just it is absolutely just the case that for trans people, we do just know that those cues that other people make pick up on about us just do not match up with our sense of who we are. And that's why we do things and make changes and ask people to try and work with us to see us differently. Okay. Ross Greer, thank you. Thanks. Uh, convener, much of what I was going to ask about has actually just been covered, but following the um, conversation that we had with the previous panel, uh, Tim, the Equality Network represents the intersex community in Scotland as well. I was wondering if you'd like to expand a little bit on how what's in the bill uh, might or might not affect the community. 
it's very important to say that we don't represent the intersex community. In fact, we don't claim to represent anybody. We yeah. just speak up for people's equality. Um, our intersex project is at a very early stage, and we're in the process of speaking with intersex people in Scotland and in the rest of the UK uh, to identify what people's needs are. And that's in advance of the Scottish Government consulting about intersex equality, which they'll be doing next year. Um, we work very closely with an organisation called Intersex UK, which is one of the UK intersex organisations. Now, th they have a number of key priorities for change, including one that was mentioned by the early, earlier panel, which is the disregard for young intersex people's bodily autonomy when they have surgery, for example, performed on, on them when they're too young to consent to it, uh, to make their sex characteristics look more usual. Uh, so we are supporting Intersex UK in those calls. Now, they are not calling at the moment for the census to include a question about intersex status or sec what your sex characteristics are. They are calling for the Equality Act to be amended so that people are protected from discrimination because they are intersex, because they have what's called variations of sex characteristics, that is, their bodies, either in their chromosomes or their gonads or their genitals or their hormones, do not match what is considered as to be typical for male or female. So we would like to see the Equality Act amended to protect from discrimination on that grounds, but at the moment that is not a protected characteristic, and at the moment people are not calling for that to be added in, uh, added into the census as a, as a separate question. The, the question would arise if you asked about biological sex rather than, as has happened for the past 20 years, uh, self-identified sex, then I think you would need to consult with intersex people about exactly how they would want that handled. But as we've already explained, we think that would be a very retrograde step in any case. Thank you. Thank you. Kenneth. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, convener. I mean, the previous witnesses said in the evidence, uh, for example, for Women's Scotland said, and I quote, human beings are sexually dimorphic and an individual's biological sex is an unchangeable characteristic. Is that something you would agree or disagree with? Uh, certainly, as far as biological sex characteristics are concerned, that is hormones, genitals, etc. Those are obviously, some of those are obviously not unchangeable because uh, some trans people have sur surgery to change some of their sex characteristics. Yeah. In terms of chromosomes, you can't change your chromosomes, but it's not as simple as people are either XX or XY. Uh -huh. There are people with XXY chromosomes. There are people whose bodies have more than one chromosome in them. Uh, so so uh, things are not black and white. Okay. Uh, I mean, one of the things that you mentioned earlier was um, about privacy, you talked about privacy. Um, but surely the kind of three questions that you're looking for would make privacy less likely because at the mo if, if you have a situation whereby um, you're asked, uh, what was your sex at birth, for example, male or female, and then you have a, a, que a voluntary question about uh, whether it's gender or what's called trans identity, however you want to answer it, that allows people to protect their privacy. Surely if it's a compulsory question, that asks um, whether you're male, female, or if you like other, um, that is less likely to allow people to have privacy because it's a compulsory question. Um, I, I, if the sex question is going to be compulsory, mm -hmm. then if it asks about sex at birth, that is going to be an invasion of privacy because people who are living as men or women, trans men or women, will have to answer that question with the opposite of the way they live. So a trans woman will have to put male, and that is an invasion of her privacy. If the question asks about your self-identified sex, then a trans woman will be able to put woman and her privacy is protected from that point of view. The other, the, the question about gender identity, we think should be voluntary, uh, but there is an overall issue about how you protect people's privacy in answering even the voluntary questions. And that goes to something else, it goes to the arrangements for doing the census and the arrangements that need to be put in place so that individuals who share a household can fill in the individual form in a way that is private. And NRS, I know, are putting a lot of thought into exactly how that can be done so that you can do that without yeah, the people who share, share the house. Yeah, with I, I, I think you've raised an important point there. It's one person per household that fills in the form, and then sometimes that can cause obviously issues and concerns in certain in, in certain households where people may not be uh, um, open necessarily to having a member of a, of a different uh, 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 identity. Um, I'm, I'm, 
I'm, I'm not really... I still think, though, that if you've got the three categories, that makes privacy more difficult, so I'll have to agree to disagree on that. One of the things, though, that um, I think came out um, from the previous uh, session, although I had to coax it a wee bit, was there's clearly uh, an issue uh, among some women's groups about people being able to uh, self-identify in the potential threat to females, which was expressed by a previous panel, uh, of this. Um, and I think the reason for that possibly is the rapid growth in the trans community in the last decade or two. I mean, the number of people um, um, who, who are trans has is grown, I think, 700%. I had a, a soft figure. I don't know if that's accurate or not, uh, over the last five years. So how do you feel about, how, how would you reassure um, these women who have concerns about safe spaces, etc., um, um, uh, in terms of the, these issues? I'll give a very quick answer and then I'll let Vic continue. No, because Vic did touch on it a wee bit earlier on, I suppose, uh, in terms of the home care uh, uh, thing, but I'm talking about in wider issues. I mean, my quick answer to that would be that I would strongly urge the committee, if you have concerns in that area, to speak to the organisations in Scotland that are providing. Uh, women-only services to the most vulnerable women in Scotland. So mm -hmm. organisations like Rape Crisis Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid, the, mm -hmm. all these organisations now provide services that are trans-inclusive, so they provide their services to trans women. They've been developing that over many years and they have worked through these issues to ensure that they know that they are providing safe services. And I'm very sure that those organisations and organisations that work for women generally in Scotland, like in gender, would be very happy to uh, speak to members of the committee and to give further evidence on this. OK, and a question asked the first panel, so I think it's fair to ask uh, of yourselves, is, uh, is the quote actually in the Quality Network and Scottish Trans Alliance submission where it says, a non-binary person is a person identifying as either having a gender which is in between or beyond the two categories, man and woman, as fluctuating between man and woman or having no gender either permanently or some of the time. Now, I can understand people who have a trans identity. I'm, I'm, I'm struggling with this. Uh, um, some of the time, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not really... How can we have robust census data if people are having an identity some of the time? I mean, I, I, can, I just wonder if that can be explained for me a wee bit. Yeah, sure. So we, it's a hard definition to say without taking a breath, isn't it? Um, we, yes, we use the term non-binary as a kind of catch-all definition for all trans people who wouldn't say just the word man or just the word woman describes their sense of themselves. And the kind of expanded version that you read out gives examples of the various kinds of ways in which the word man or woman might not feel like it describes themselves. So even if somebody has a fluctuating gender identity or a sense of themselves that shifts, we would categorize that person as being sort of permanently non-binary because having a gender identity that shifts would make you the sort of person who wouldn't use the word man or woman all of the time to describe themselves. Does that make sense? It, it does in a way, but are you saying therefore that their identity is a, is a kind of psychological thing rather than something that's a bit more physical? Because the, the whole, the, the key point that was made by the previous panel was about obviously biology mm. and, di and dimorphism, which we've talked about, but it's, are, you, are you saying therefore that for these people their identity is psychological? I think for some people, some aspects of how they feel about their sex are, yeah, about a kind of about how they perceive themselves, how they think about themselves. It is an it is an aspect of identity rather than about what their physical body is like. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah. To pick up on on some of Kenny Gibson's points. Um, and going back to uh, an issue that was raised by the convener, I think at the beginning, um, in uh, picking up on this discussion. Um. You know the issue of the the example of a, a vulnerable woman that wants to have intimate care provided by a woman. Uh, so we've had that discussion. You say that you don't want a blanket exemption, but there could be, in your view, you would countenance some exemptions if we go down the route that biological sex is no longer uh, to to be taken into account in that regard, but self-identification is. So would that not, though, mean that? you know, the onus then would change and the onus would be on the, the vulnerable person, the vulnerable woman, to prove that they fall within some exemption. So the onus would change at the moment. The woman says, I want intimate care provided by a woman. It's quite clear that that intimate care will be provided by a woman who was born 
as women, not who may from time to time psychologically identify as a woman, but actually a woman who was born a woman. Uh, and if then the exemption approach is taken, and it's not to be a blanket exemption, it begs the question then, you know, the onus then is on you or your family to prove that actually you fall within that exemption. I, I don't know if that's really where people want to end up in this important debate. I, yeah. I don't think that's maybe what you intend. I, I don't know. I'm no, no, I, I, yeah, I don't think that the kind of scenario that you just outlined as described would be what I would be proposing would be a, a good outcome for this. how would you so, as a, a result so with a your approach? Though. A person who did not permanently and constantly identify as a woman, we wouldn't describe as a trans woman and we wouldn't think that that person would be eligible for women-only roles. But who would make all these decisions on a, on a sort of moving basis, you know, of care? Who would make all these decisions? How would all this happen? And, and that's why, you know, the... The, 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 you know, I speak as a lawyer to trade, you know, the, the fundamental approach to definitions is a very important thing because it makes things clear, you know, because you have to then take into account a whole series of what ifs and what ifs and what ifs. And that's why a legal approach to definitions is quite important because it tries to anticipate that there will be so many different circumstances pertaining to uh, uh, issues that uh, have, uh, uh, are impacted by, uh, by definitions of whatever it is. And I just see, uh, you know, fundamental problems down the line. Um, I see the, the mandatory question remaining a binary question, the voluntary question, including uh, gender identity, if people wish to, on a voluntary basis, provide that information. I hope they do, because the purpose is to collect the data. I see that as a, a straightforward approach that reflects people's rights but also, of course, reflects other people's rights to have uh, intimate care, for example, provided by somebody of the same sex. That's how I see it. I, I, I think my answer to that would be, fundamentally, what needs to be decided here is whether the compulsory question is going to ask about those three things I mentioned earlier biological sex, legal sex, or the sex that you live as? That's the fundamental question. If the answer is the third of those, and bearing in mind that's what's been done for the last 20 years, then we would argue there has to be a third option. But the only reason for putting the third option in is not to count trans people, it's to give non-binary people an option that they can truly answer so they don't have to be dishonest by ticking either the male or the female box. That's why, th that's why there's a change from 2011. That's the only reason for a change in the compulsory question from 2011. It is not about counting Well, there people. hasn't been a change yet because that's what we're all uh, in the process exactly. of discussing. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, of what NRS is pro has proposed. Well, that's the, uh, so that's the only... Well, they've, you know, the, this bill, going back to the point, is about the voluntary section. It's not about the mandatory. Yeah. That's been clarified by the NRS this yeah. morning. Yeah. So. Sorry. Uh, sorry, sorry to okay, interrupt. Sorry. Mr Stewart hasn't asked a question and he's indicated he wants to ask sorry. a question. Stuart, I knew you had to pop out earlier. So. No, thank you, Convener. Just it's to follow up on uh, the question from uh, Kenneth Gibson. Um, uh, it was on the, on the issue of like, a, a given time. Um, uh, the, the census is about helping to plan f services for the future. Um, but if someone were to... Uh, at that particular time, uh, um, they felt as if they, they were uh, a man or a woman. Um, but uh, later on, uh, they then changed their mind. So at the, at the time of the census being completed, um, the information was accurate. But uh, I'm trying to understand that in terms of how, to, how, how that would then play out in terms of the service planning at any government and any, uh, any public body. Uh, would then uh, have to attempt to do, uh, bearing in mind that the information could, could then, uh, some uh, some period of time shortly afterwards, uh, then become inaccurate. I guess it's just to go back again to the idea that, in in totality, the sex data is incredibly useful for planning sex-specific services, but for each specific individual census response, you don't necessarily absolutely know from someone's response to the sex question, even if they are not a trans person, so that, you know, it's got nothing to do with their gender or being a trans person, you do not absolutely know with full clarity what their sex-specific healthcare needs are, just from what they've answered to that question. So although it's not impossible that some people who have a shifting sense of how they would describe their sex would answer one way and actually 
actually, if you ask them to complete the census three weeks later, they would describe it another way. In terms of the broad overall use of the sex data, it's, it, that wouldn't, we can't foresee that that would have an impact, I don't think. And could I just add, because many other questions on the census, the information just does change over time. So, for example, the census asks about your employment, and that's important also for planning services. But, of course, your employment status can change over time as well. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, just a couple of <clears throat> supplementaries to wrap up. Um, one relating to um, Kenneth um, Gibson's question about fluid fluid identities. Um, you'll be aware of the uh, the story of the uh, Credit Suisse director um, Philip Bunce and or Pippa Bunce. Um, who spends half of the week as Pippa Bunce, who identifies as a woman, and the other half of the week he's Philip Bunce, identifying as a man. Uh, in terms of the question, how would you expect Philip or Pippa to answer the sex question on any particular day? I, I think that that's... I, I don't know that I would be able to answer that question. Um, we... We, in terms of how we would probably think of that person's identity, we would probably describe them as a non-binary person, and we would probably therefore say that they would answer the third other option on, on the self-identified sex question. But obviously I couldn't right, presume to he, know. Or he or she identifies as a woman on particular days, and actually won a women's award, actually. I uh, understand it in the... Uh, in some financial awards in the city, won a, a, a women's award. So would it be would it be acceptable for uh, Pippa or, or or Philip to identify as the sex or gender that they identify with on that particular day? Just happened to be when he was filling out or she was filling out the census. I, I think that each person who completes the census is able to select whatever box they want to anyway, regardless of if they're a trans person or not a trans person. I don't, I don't, I don't feel able to kind of say which yeah. one I think that they would need to tick. Okay, that's fine. And the other thing I wanted to wrap up, if you'll bear with me, is I've now found your submission uh, to the um, Women in Equality Select Committee Transgender Inquiry. Um, and in your submission, this is the uh, Scottish Transgender Alliance, you say um, that you want the Equality Act 2010 should be amended to remove the genuine occupational requirement, allowing some jobs to require applicants that must be cisgender, that's not trans, and replace it with a, gen uh, a genuine occupational requirement, allowing posts delivering trans-specific services uh, to um, exclusive cisgender people. So basically, um, what you're arguing there is that there should be a general genuine occupational requirement for trans services, but not for services to women. That's what it says. Well, there are two different, well, there are more than two, but there are sex genuine occupational requirements. And there's also, in the case for trans people, um, the occupational requirement is reversed. So, for example, you can have a job that requires that the applicant be a woman. You can also, however, have a job that requires that an applicant not be a transsexual. That's the language that the law would use. So we were saying that the latter of those two requirements, it should no longer be only that you can require a post to not be held by a transsexual, but in fact that some posts, for example, at organisations like mine, might require that a post holder be a trans person. Right, OK. Right, thanks very much. And finally, I just wanted to raise the issue um, that you mentioned earlier on in terms of the Equality and Human Rights Commission's advice. Um, you, the, the first panel referred to the Guardian newspaper uh, invited people to, to give legal advice uh, on this whole issue of gender recognition uh, from a variety of different uh, points of view. Um, now, one of the people that they invited was Julian Norman, um, who is a barrister um, in London, and um, they pointed out that um, actually the Equality and Human Rights Commission advice on single-sex um, spaces had actually changed, and although originally they said that um, that they, you know, someone who had a gender reassignment characteristic could enter single-sex spaces, they had changed that, and it was now more ambiguous. Their advice. Were you aware of that? 
think there, there are two separate issues here. There's, first of all, what is the meaning of sex in the equality law? My understanding is the Equality and Human Rights Commission are very clear about that. They talk about legal sex, not biological sex. The second is about these exemptions. And is a single sex service for women, for example, allowed to turn away a trans woman without that being gender reassignment discrimination, whether or not that woman has a gender recognition certificate? And the answer is yes, because that's what the law says. So what the EHRC is saying there is that a single sex service can turn away a trans woman, uh, even if she has a gender reassignment, uh, a gender recognition certificate and therefore is legally a woman. They can turn her away because she's trans, because of the exemption, without being taken to court for gender reassignment discrimination. Having said that, all of the services in Scotland that provide these crucial services to women don't do that. But there is that legal ability to do it. That's a separate question. That's about gender reassignment discrimination. It's a separate issue from what the meaning of the term sex is in the Equality Act which the Commission are very clear is about legal sex and not about biological sex. I see. Clearly, there's quite, obviously, there's a wider debate here and things are shifting. And if you read that Guardian article, people, eminent, all eminent lawyers seem to have different views on this. And I think that's one of the criticisms, that there is a lack of clarity. So, in a way, this committee has been asked to look at some of these big fundamental issues and crystallising the census bill at a time when there is some legal uncertainty, even amongst the experts. Would you agree with that? I mean, certainly there's a big debate going on at the moment, as you know, about the Gender Recognition Act. Uh, the UK government and the Scottish government both have proposals on that. That is going to have some impact on the way the census is perceived when it happens. So the timing from that point of view for this bill, fortunately, this bill doesn't specify what the sex question should be. Uh, the Gender Recognition Act bill is, as I understand it, been promised by the Scottish Government for the 2019 to 2020 Scottish parliamentary year. So by the time this committee, if it is this committee, gets to look at the census order, which specifies the subject matter of each, of each question, and the, the census uh, regulations that set out the actual question paper, we'll be much further along in terms of that process of developing the new Gender Recognition Act. Uh, so I, I, from that point of view, I think that's going to be the key point at which you want to look very closely at what the Scottish Government is proposing the wording of the question should be. And as I say, I think by then things will be a lot clearer in terms of what the future of gender recognition law, these reforms that the Scottish Government has proposed, what those will look like than they are, than they are now. Because we're now what, 10 months away, nine months away from the point where the Scottish Government will be announcing in its legislative programme for next year what they're doing about the Gender Recognition Act. Okay. Well, thank you very much uh, for coming to give evidence today and we shall now move into private session. Thank you.